Okay, so my name is Katie Lewis, and I am the research manager at Tin Mountain Conservation Center. I manage the internship program along with the long-term avian and stream studies that we conduct here. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about those stream studies. I'm going to be talking about our stream restoration and brook trout study, where we conduct large wood addition restorations in the Mount Washington Valley in New Hampshire, and also study the impact that that has on in-stream habitat and eastern brook trout populations. So for some background, uh, about why we kind of do this, why we've been doing it for so long. Historically, New Hampshire was and still is predominantly forested. Because of that, a lot of our streams were and are located within a forested landscape, and we'd get large mature trees falling into streams and providing a lot of benefits to the ecosystem in the form of habitat and in-stream habitat complexity, nutrient retention, and sediment storage. But New Hampshire also has an early history of intense agriculture, and silviculture practices that removed a lot of forest buffers along streams and clear cut a lot of forest stands. Uh, so today, New Hampshire is still largely forested as a lot of the farms were abandoned and forestry practices have been updated, um, but less than half of a percent of forest stands in the state today are considered old growth. So forested streams are lacking a lot of the naturally occurring wood inputs that provide all these benefits that I listed. Um, on top of that, we're in a time of extreme climate fluctuations that include more severe storm events. We've had three 100-year storm events in the last 10 years, um, and also things like intense and extended droughts. So streams are also not as resilient against these rapidly changing conditions, as well as kind of missing out on a lot of the benefits from these large mature trees falling into streams. So before I get into Tin Mountain's role in restoring some of these streams, I have some general background on our organization and where we fit into all of this. So Tin Mountain Conservation Center is an environmental education, stewardship, and conservation research nonprofit. We were founded in 1980, um, and in 2010, we formalized our intern-based research program that consists of a few main components. We have a long-term monitoring project examining avian and forest community response to managed timber harvests, and then we also have our stream restoration and trout research program where we study the effects of adding, woods to, adding wood to streams in the ecosystem, on the ecosystem. Uh, the, the basics of woody additions are pretty straightforward. So we pull trees from the forest surrounding our study streams while keeping a buffer around the stream intact, um, and then place these larger wood pieces in the water, usually securing them in the banks of the stream. We follow NRCS guidance on how much wood to add, which is an end goal of about four or five large wood structures or pieces within every 100 foot segment of the stream. That number is to get to around 8 to 10 percent in-stream wood coverage total. Um, and to give an example of why this is necessary, a lot of the streams that we survey prior to adding wood have existing coverages of about a half of a percent, uh, up to 2 percent coverage of wood in the streams. So as I've alluded to, there are several benefits to adding, or several goals and benefits to adding wood to the streams. Uh, the first is to slow stream velocity, which in turn allows higher nutrient retention for in-stream organisms through the collection and rafting of organic material. Um, adding wood reduces the amount of siltation, so things are moving slower, not scouring and washing out. Um, and it has also been shown to increase the frequency and depth of pools, and in the same vein, increase um, in-stream habitat diversity and complexity. Um, it also re-engages floodplains and increases resiliency then against some of these more extreme climate conditions that we're seeing. Um, overall, the goal is to enhance the in-stream habitat for both uh, just the stream ecosystem itself um, and for the specific organisms such as the eastern brook trout. So just a, a few words about the, the brook trout. Um, they have some specific habitat requirements that the goals of woody additions align really well with. Uh, these trout are found in cold freshwater streams in the east, preferably with gravel stream beds, substrates for spawning. Um, they also require adequate pool area and depth that allows for resting and hiding cover and cooler, more stable temperatures that you get with, with deeper water depths. Um, they also require a food source, typically benthic macroinvertebrates, um, which also benefit from these woody additions and which allow for 
that allow for increased nutrient and habitat retention for them. Um, so Tin Mountain has been involved in uh, woody addition enhancements, restorations in the Mount Washington Valley since 2010. From that time, we've conducted our assessment and restoration activities on 24 streams in Carroll County in New Hampshire, which has come out to over 16 miles of restored stream length. Uh, the forests where we do this work are primarily northern hardwood and hemlock mixed sands. So that is typically the kind of wood that ends up in the streams. Along with the actual restoration work, we conduct pre and post monitoring and data collection to assess whether what we're doing is working as we'd expect it to. And so this is just a map of all of our study streams that we've worked on in the past. Um, it's pretty spread out all over Carroll County, just so you have a sense of, of where we've done our work to kind of put it into context. So as I've mentioned, a big part of our work that we do in restoring these streams is assessing them before and then sometimes after we've done the, the restoration work. So we have a few different aspects of this. The first is we conduct in-stream habitat assessments that I'll get into some more detail into in a bit. Um, we also catalog all the wood that is already in the stream before we add more wood. So we characterize the size and some general general characteristics, like whether that wood is trapping sediment, if it has pools associated with it, if it's providing cover. Um, we also assess the trout population before treatment by electrofishing, and we take some basic water chemistry metrics like pH, dissolved oxygen, and temperature. Uh, so to get into a little bit more detail about the in-stream habitat assessments that we do, um, we measure different characteristics at one representative riffle and one representative pool every 100 feet for the entire stream treatment reach. So which in each, within each of these habitat units, the riffles and the pools, we measure a couple of different things. We measure canopy cover, the length of that riffle or pool, the average and maximum depths of those habitat units, wetted and bankful widths at the habitat units, and we also do some qualitative measurements like characterizing the predominant stream bed substrate, gravel, cobble, bedrock. Um, we also visually estimate the amount of and type of cover present in each riffle and pool. So that could be organic material like leaf litter, it could also be wood or undercut banks, that sort of thing. Um, so we also assess the severity of bank erosion every 100 feet and the dominant riparian community. So we characterize the forests buffering these streams, which like I said, typically are northern hardwood or hemlock or a mix of those two communities predominantly. So another big part of the research that we do um, and a big part of our pre and post treatment monitoring involves electrofishing to get a sense of trout population metrics before and after adding wood. So we partner with the New Hampshire Fish and Game as they generally give or generously give their time and equipment for this work and expertise. Um, we use a backpack electroshocker to assess the trout in 150 foot segments spaced every 500 feet of the study or treatment reach. Uh, we collect all the fish that come up with each pass. Uh, we weigh them, we measure them and generally assess their condition. Um, and for the most part, the primary species we get is Eastern Brook trout, but we also have gotten sculpin and, and dace as well. So I talked about the pre and kind of post treatment assessment monitoring. So I wanted to break down what we collect and when in more details. Um, so you're better, I have giving a better picture about um, what went into the data analyses that we did. So as I've said, before adding wood, all of the streams have that habitat assessment done, those measurements taken, characterizing riffle and pool habitat. Uh, we also catalog the existing wood before we add more we electrofish and we collect water chemistry data using a YSI. So that all happens before we add the wood and has happened on all of our study streams. On a subset of sites, we've also collected some of these data in the years following woody additions. So in 11 of these streams, we went back six or seven years after we added more wood. It depends on when they were treated with woody additions. Um, and redid the in-stream ripple and pool habitat assessment. So measuring those habitat unit depths, canopy cover, the substrate, that sort of thing. We also in the past have electrofished that subset of sites each year following woody additions and also collected associated water chemistry measurements. 
So that subset of resampled sites has allowed us to examine the change over time in the habitat data as well as the trout population and how things have shifted or not based on uh, the, the wood that we've added to the stream. So for the data analyses for this project, we generally looked at habitat and trout response to adding wood. And we did that in two different ways depending on the data available. So we conducted a MANOVA or a multivariate analysis of variance for the in-stream habitat data where we had measurements taken before adding wood and then those same measurements taken again six or seven years after adding wood at that subset of sites. Um, and then we also looked at trout density and biomass overall pre and post treatment and compared those two things. Um, for the data that we had measurements taken each year after treatment, so the electrofishing data, the water chemistry data, we also did some basic linear modeling to track trout metrics and water temperature over time. Um, all of this was done using R. And so here are some of our results. This is the uh, results of the MANOVA with the habitat characteristics. It's the significant results of the MANOVA. Um, so from this graph, you can see that water depths in both habitat units, so average and maximum ripple and pool depths post-treatment, are significantly higher than the pre-treatment measurements. And the same is true for the percent cover in riffles and pools. So after adding wood, we see a higher percentage of cover in these habitat units. For the trout metrics that we measured using a MANOVA, uh, we looked at trout biomass and trout density, um, pre and post treatment. We included the visual for biomass here, even though it wasn't significant just for context, but we did have a significantly higher trout density in the years post treatment as opposed to the data collected pre treatment. So we're, we're not necessarily getting bigger trout post treatment as compared to pre treatment, but we are getting more. Um, and so then this next slide just digs a little deeper into trout density versus time. Um, so since we have data each year following treatment for electrofishing, we were able to plot trout density versus the number of years since treatment, not just pre versus post kind of two point uh, data points. Um, and you can see that that increases over time. And again, biomass was shown to have a negative association with time since treatment, but it was not significant. Um, I also, as an aside, tested trout density versus the habitat characteristics that change significantly post-treatment, uh, so, tr so trout density versus water depth in riffles and pools, um, and also percent cover, and trout density was positively associated with those factors as well, so positively associated with deeper water and also more cover in these habitat units. Um, and then this final graph just shows uh, water temperature versus years post-treatment. Um, there was not a significant association between water temperature and time post-treatment, but you can still see that there's a general downward trend line, which makes sense if we're also getting deeper water as a result of these woody additions. It would make sense that it's also overall cooler because of that. So uh, to kind of sum this all up, our data uh, indicate that a lot of the habitat characteristics that are important to eastern brook trout in the organisms they rely on things like deeper water temperature, lower, or deeper water, lower temperatures, um, increased cover, are positively influenced by adding wood to streams as time goes on post-treatment. Um, so this is an ongoing project. Uh, as, as we take our next steps, I just wanted to go over some other things that we're going to be continuing to do. Um, so our goals are to continue resampling all of the habitat assessments for the streams that we've worked on in the past as we're getting to 10 or 11 years post adding wood. Um, so we have that subset of sites with the six or seven years post treatment data. We'd like to go back and do a complete resurvey of everything we've done as time has continued to go on to see if what we've observed is a trend that is going to continue or if there is a, a certain point where things level off. Um, we're also, we'd also like to have uh, multiple observational checkpoints as we get further from when wood was actually added to see how everything shifts, as an and, shifts and is influenced over an even, even longer period of time. Um, I also mentioned in our earlier data collection slides that uh, we do an in-stream wood survey that we conduct prior to adding the wood. 
Um, and so far we haven't reassessed the wooden streams where we've done our restorations. So also coming, coming up, we're going to go back to those study streams and catalog all the wood by size, see if wood that we've added has created pools, if it's storing sediment and nutrients and that sort of thing. We're also going to keep electrofishing study streams to continue mapping trout populations and their response to these woody addition treatments. And as I said, this project is ongoing, so we are also continuing to enhance streams throughout Carroll County. Um, we have several more lined up to, to keep doing this work and add to our data over the next few years, so we're excited about that. So with that, I'd like to thank all of our partners and funders, uh, without whom we would not be able to have such a successful and long-running project. So the, I'd like to thank the Carroll and Belknap County Conservation Districts, our local NRCS offices, uh, New Hampshire Fishing Game, Trout Unlimited. We've worked with the Nature Conservancy and the Shrokorwa Lake Conservancy. Um, Ryan Harvey, our Sawyer, who makes the actual adding wood to the streams possible. And then, of course, Dick Fortin, who ran this project for the last 10 plus years and built an incredible foundation for this project. Um, and also our funders, who we, uh, we work with the New England Rivers and Forest Fund with NIFWIF, the New Hampshire Moose Plate Grant, and the Anonymous Foundation.